We have a lot of verses today, so we're not going to stand and read all of them first. We're just going to go through them as we cover them. And I'd like to start with prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to turn to it. Thank you that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord. And um, we know that it'll accomplish every purpose it's sent to accomplish. So we ask, Lord, that today you would meet with us. And we pray that you would encourage your people. Lord, help us to, to not just hear your word, but obey it. Father, and uh, we're grateful, Lord, that you've laid down a template for us in your, in your word regarding how to study it. So we pray that you would be blessed. You're the guest of honor, Jesus, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless us as we study your word. You've said that if we re- continue in your word, we're your disciples indeed. So we thank you for that. We, we, we want that. We want to be uh, demonstrating that we're your disciples. So we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to be in John chapter 11, so you can turn there, and we're going to be looking at Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. For those of us that have walked with the Lord a little while, uh, Lazarus, and we can call him Laz, I mean, we've known him for a while, We're, we're, we're on good terms with him, talk about, you know he was called Laz, he had to be, who wouldn't do that? So, uh, so he's a, he's a blessing to be able to kind of see how the Lord ministered in this family's uh, lives and um, what he did, a true miracle. So we're blessed to be able to study this whole account. Um, I w- do want to mention as we begin here that, that this is the seventh sign, the final sign that, that John writes. I mean, we've been tracking these things and we've been going through the Gospel of John. There are seven signs. There's also seven I am statements. And so usually he couples this miracle or sign with something about related to who he is. He usually connects those two. Today will be no exception because he's going to say, I am the resurrection and the life. It's his fifth out of seven I am statements. So it's worth a, we have a couple more of those to go. Uh, and, and so this is a beautiful account. I love this account. And one of the things that I love about this account, and it's amazing how God can u- do so many things with one passage. Um, just amazing. But the fact that we get to see Jesus' heart here and see him weep and, and see him have just be affected by all these things is, is such a gift. And which it can encourage us that his heart obviously is just as much for us as, as it was for these people. You know, he cares about everything that we go through, cares about everything that concerns us. There's no request that we can make that's too small or too large. And so we get to see that. Now, as we begin, look at verse 1. Um, we see here that this family that lived in the city named, called Bethany, it says in verse 1, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. So Bethany uh, was about, it's about two miles from Jerusalem. It's on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. When you go to Israel, you go to the Mount of Olives, and then you walk down the traditional path that was for Palm Sunday, and then you, and you go across the Kidron Valley, and you go into the, the, the city of Jerusalem there. Today, the city that used to be Bethany, it's a uh, Palestinian area. It's called El Azaria, which actually means in, in Arabic, place of Lazarus. And what I love about this is that it's been documented that this was the place, this was the city. In fact, I want to read you something that's really interesting. In 1873, a French Christian apologist named Charles Clermont Gonneau accidentally discovered a cave near Bethany that proved to be an ancient burial catacomb. Inside, he found 30 ancient stone coffins or ossuaries. Engraved on the sides of three of these ossuaries from the cave were the names of these names. Eliezer, which is the, Eliezer is the Hebrew form of um, Lazarus, which is Greek. So it was Eliezer, Martha, and Mary. Those names were found there with crosses uh, stamped on them or written on them. And so the, I love when, when archaeology catches up with the Bible. Isn't that great? You know, it's like they discover things and they, they establish that them as fact. And we already knew they were fact way before they put their stamp of validation. There's so many times in, in history or in scripture where they where they mock and they, they, they say, this didn't happen. There was never a Pontius Pilate. Then they find an inscription that says Pontius Pilate. They're always behind. And uh, so, you know, it's, you can feel sorry for them if you want, but I don't. I feel like they should just believe what the scripture says because and, 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 it's been proven right. It's never been proven wrong. 
Now, we already know about these sisters and Lazarus from Luke chapter 10. You may remember in that account that Jesus goes into their house. Martha is just super busy, just flying around the house trying to get things done. And he, he, she wants Jesus to correct Mary because she says Mary's just sitting at his feet learning. And tell, tell uh, my sister Mary that she needs to get busy, you know, basically. And then Jesus talks about, oh, you're concerned about many things, um, Martha. It, you know, Mary has chosen the better thing and the better portion, and that will not be taken from her. And then this relationship began there, and, and, and um, Lazarus was, we don't hear a lot from Lazarus at all. In our next chapter, when we get into chapter 12, after he's been risen from the dead, he's at a table. And, and uh, how disappointing could that be if you were Lazarus to have to come back after you've already left for something infinitely better, and then you have to come back? I mean, that was probably a, a great trial for him, um, but we'll get into that. So we have to understand the timing of all of this that's happening here because it'll help us understand how God worked in this situation and how, honestly, from a human vantage point, how pathetic and dire and just without hope, you know, with, apart from the Lord, that this situation was. Um, Jesus was at another area, we saw that before, where he's beyond the Jordan, where the uh, John the baptizer had been baptizing. He's, 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 he's far away there. And so Mary, um, she's always at Jesus' feet. Like every, there's three times in scripture, she's always at his feet. And so you know that she had learned, obviously, a lot. Martha learned a lot, of course, up, up, from this, up to this point. But they, they, wanted to, um, they wanted to let Jesus know what was going on. In verse 2, we're told that it, was that it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And then we were told in verse 3 that, that they sent Jesus via a messenger. So we're, we're told this, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now they called him Lord, which is obviously fitting and appropriate. And they used the word behold there. We don't use that word behold uh, at all, unless you're using it without my knowledge. And if that's the case, I'd like to know if you're actually using that word. Uh, but it means to carefully consider something. Carefully consider something. Something And actually what's interesting is that this word is, in the original language, is in a command form. And it really speaks of the urgency. Because they're not commanding Jesus to, you know, like, they're, like he has to answer to them. But he's really receiving this in, in a, in showing that, that they're showing that this is, this is a dire situation. They don't use Lazarus' name. They say the one you love, which is wonderful that they knew that. He would know that. They don't even have to say his name. And they says he is sick, which actually there's a few words in, in the New Testament for sick. This one means failing or fading. You know, basically it's talking about there's not much time left. I think we've all been there when that's happening with someone that we love or someone that we know that's passing away. And that's the time when you say, um, you know, hey, time, they don't, there's not long. They don't have long. Uh, there's not a lot of time. There's urgency there. That's the, what they're trying to communicate. They're saying to Jesus, the one whom you love doesn't have long. And, and so this is the situation here. And, and then they ask, um, they don't ask Jesus to do anything. They just literally say, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. They would probably never actually, because out of respect and everything, and just to some say, hey, Jesus, can you do this? Or please do this. They're just saying he's, there's not much time left and they're leaving it in his hands. Um, and, and that's appropriate. Um, but Jesus is going to engage in some divine procrastination. I, my procrastination is anything but divine. The, the, this, this procrastination is, is of the Lord. It's, it's, this is a, a, a timing to all of this. And um, there's a very special reason which he gets into uh, in terms of what the purpose is, which we'll get to in a second here. Um, so all of this is really important to understand the timing of this. And when you study this out and you study the timing of everything and Jesus waiting and all of that, what you learn is that uh, the same day that the messenger was deployed by the sisters is the same day that Lazarus died. And, and in their, their whole culture, they would bury the same day. 
They didn't do embalming like the Egyptians did. They would bury the same day. So they sent out, the picture is, they sent out this messenger to go tell Jesus what's going on. He can decide what he's going to do. And then after that, Lazarus dies. So this guy, they know that he's probably not there yet in terms of even talking to Jesus, potentially. And then they bury him, which takes some time and all of that. So this, this messenger is going about 20 miles to where he's walking 20 miles, basically, where Jesus was at. And so that would take a day if you're moving quickly. I don't know if you've ever walked 20 miles, but it's, that's a long way. The benefit to him going to Jesus is that he's going downhill the whole way. It would take him a little bit longer to come back because Bethany was 2,400 feet above sea level, and where Jesus is at is 1,200 feet below sea level. So that person, when he comes back, is going to have to make up 3,600 feet in elevation. So he's definitely getting his steps in, and, you know, and he's having to deal with this elevation when he's coming back. So the chronology of all this you know, is, is, is as follows. On day one, the messenger comes to Jesus. That same day, Jesus or Lazarus dies and is buried. Day two, the messenger returns to Bethany. Day three, Jesus waits one more day, then departs. And day four, Jesus arrives in Bethany. Now, God is never late. And as it's been said, he's, he's rarely on time, but in, and sometimes he's early. I mean, he's rarely, you know, you know the quote. I can't even get it right right now. But he's not, he's not late. Sometimes he's early. But, he's, but so his timetable is different than ours. And then notice in verse 4, Jesus reacts to this. Look with me at verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, this, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So he's saying the ultimate cause of, of his death is not going to be this sickness. Lazarus is going to die from another sickness later. We don't know what that is. He's going to be dying a second time, unless he's martyred, which could have happened. I don't know. But he's saying, ultimately, this is not going to be his final, the final conclusion regarding this because I'm going to intervene. He knows that in his heart. And, and so um, he knew that everyone's, um, everyone's expectation would be it would be better for Jesus to come sooner and prevent him from dying in the first place. And that's what some of the people that are with uh, Mary and Martha are going to say uh, and, and going to comment and all of that. But... It's interesting here because he says, it's not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Sometimes God works differently than we expect. And, and most often, it's, it's for our benefit in some way. And, and we can know that because God always does what's best for us. We can always think of the cross and look back at the cross when we are second-guessing his best, you know, if he has our best interest in mind. He, he loves us. He always does what's best. And so he's saying that the glory of God, the Son of God, is going to be glorified through this. Now, in verse 5, we're told, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This is not in here by accident. Every jot and tittle, every part of the, the scriptures is inspired. Jesus said, My word will outlive the heavens and the earth. So this is not put in here by accident. He wants all the readers to know that there's love involved in this relationship. And, and he's about to say in the next verse, he's going to delay, delay a couple days. But he wants us to know that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And, and he's demonstrated that over and over again, just like he's demonstrated that in our lives. He's demonstrated his love so, so much. The more, longer you walk with the Lord, the, you have such a great advantage because you've seen him act appropriately and do things for your best, even when you didn't understand, and you have that history with him uh, and all of that. Plus, of course, you have God's word, which is, which is the main way that we know that. But it's important for us to remember when God doesn't work the way that we think he should, that he's already demonstrated his love for us by shedding his blood for us on the cross. And we should never second guess him and his ways. Do we feel like God owes us something? I think it's important to ask this question. Do we feel like he owes us something? He owes us in any way? Or are we eternally indebted for what he's already done for us? If he does not, one, not, no more things for us, he's, he's, then his last, it would be enough. It would be sufficient because of our wealth that we have and our forgiveness and how we're on our way to heaven and all of that. So we have to understand that, that, that these divine procrastinations have a purpose behind them. And God doesn't always work in the way that we would expect. So this this would be they would be in the midst of this loss and heartache and 
and all that before the Jesus even starts to head back. They've already had the funeral. And so, uh, but of course, none of this takes Jesus by surprise. So we're told in verse six, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now this appears from our limited perspective that this was, a, this was not the best decision. I mean, why, why didn't he just leave right away? I mean, um, you'd expect that verse to say, um, so when he heard that he was sick, he dropped everything he was doing and immediately left for Bethany. But that's not how he chose to work. And this is, a, this is instructive, as he's going to mention in a moment, this is instructive for the disciples. It's instructive for Martha and Mary. It's instructive for us. That God has a perfect timing for things, and he doesn't always do things that we would expect he would do, but they're always what's best, and we can trust him. That's what God's working towards in this, the lessons here in this chapter for, for all of us. So he stayed two more days in this place, and um, you know he wanted them to trust him. I mean, they probably already given up, Martha, Martha and Mary. Like, he's, you know, it's already done. It's too late. And, and, and so they have to trust in all of that. So we have to understand that God's working in ways that are different than what we would expect. For instance, when you're a child and you're, uh, you know, really young, let's say you're seven or eight, and your parents are telling you this has to happen, and you can't relate to it, you don't understand it, you may throw a, tant a, a tantrum, and, 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 but you have to realize later, and you see it when you're older, like that made total sense. I'm so glad that they made that decision. So we can trust him, but it's hard in the middle of it. It's hard in the middle of the battle in that tribulation of us tr struggling and going through things to trust him, even when we don't see. You know, we've been going through Genesis, and, and, uh, and we, when we covered the part that Jacob was dealing with this, you know, his, his brothers came back and told what happened and they kept one of the brothers behind and he said, all, everything is against me. He had no idea that God was actually at work in freeing him and his family and providing for them and all the things that God was doing behind the scenes, reconciling their family. He didn't see any of it. He just saw from a, a very limited vantage, vantage point. And, he, and so he said, everything's against me. And that's what, that's what, you know, Mary and Martha could be thinking as well. So we live in a demonic world, a fallen world. There's demonic forces, there's sinful people, there's all these things, but God is greater than all of it. He's, he can intervene and supernaturally. He can you take these things and, and help us when we're going through them. And he can supernaturally compensate. And it's all part of sanctification to bring us into more and more holiness. We can know one thing's going to happen for sure in our lives, and that's sanctification. Him making us more like Christ. The Lord's half brother James wrote in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So we think we're going through a trial that we're now, we're, because of this trial, I'm actually going to be lacking. But God says, no, this is a whole perfect work that He has for us to make us more. Uh, complete, make us more like Christ. So his intention is always for us to be to be more like Christ as a result of it, and to be to produce character and all these things. Verse seven. Then after this, he said to the disciples, "Let us go to Ju Judea again." The disciples said to him, "Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again." Like, like Jesus, I don't know if you realize this, but. They're actually trying to kill you, so why would you go near uh, all of that? And it's so funny how, you know, how we can <laughs> make our contributions, and it's not, doesn't, it's not really helpful to the Lord. Um, and then it's, it's Jesus' answer in verse 9, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. And he's, he knows that because there is 12 hours in their day that would go 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And, and he knows that if a person's walking in the physical realm during, during the, the daytime hours, they can see. But in darkness, they're going to stumble. They're going, and, he, and he's basically saying that he, he is going to be doing his ministry during the time that it's been appointed. And nothing's going to happen regarding him being arrested or captured or killed or whatever until it's the perfect timing for that to happen. And so, you know, he, he goes over that. And then he says, these things he said, and after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, 
but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. <laughs> All he needs is a, la- a little nap, Lord. You know, if he's sleeping, he's going to get better. Why in such a rush? Why would we jeopardize and be, uh, you know, at, in, at risk when we don't have to be? He's going to get better. And then <laughs> it says, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they, they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I would say that when you say plainly, I mean, I, that's what I call clarity. You know, he just literally just tells him the truth. This is the situation. Because he refers to believers when we die as sleep. We don't believe in soul sleep, but, we, but it's, it, because it's such a temporary thing. It's not really, we move. We don't die, you know, we move. You know, we lose our, our we shed this body, but we move. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord there. So um, I love the clarity there. And then this is the whole thing that he's getting at related to the disciples in verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So he's stretching the disciples. It's not only going to be, this whole thing's going to be utilized in the lives of the sisters, but and everyone that's watching, but it's also instructive for the disciples uh, because they needed to believe that you may believe. Like, believe what? Believe in me that I'm greater than death. I'm greater than death and someone dying for four days. That's, it's no problem for me to do. They need to see that. And, and he recognizes uh, that they need to see that to them. Um, now, what's interesting is that at the rapture, you know, he's, the dead in Christ will rise first. Four days is nothing. We're talking 2,000 years. No problem at all. He can raise the dead. So there's nothing too difficult for him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thanks for that faith statement there. <laughs> it's like, uh, he shouldn't be called the twin. He should be called the Eeyore. I'm gonna die. We're gonna, let's go and die. You know, Eeyore just, um, you know, communicating nothing but pessimism the whole time. But one thing you can give Thomas credit for is that he's loyal. You know, it's like, he may not have a lot of faith, but he is, he is pretty loyal to be able to say, well, let's stand with our brother. He died. Let's die with him. Let's make that statement. You know, it's, uh, uh, I love that. How he, it's included in there. But he says in verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So, and, and so they're, they're going to say, both of them are going to say this to Jesus. First it's Martha, then it's going to be Mary. I don't believe it was a disrespectful tone or scolding him or anything I ble- or blaming him. I think they're just greatly disappointed. They're just expressing their frustration because it doesn't make any sense. Why, why, aren't, why weren't you here? You know, you could have been here, but you weren't. And it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it would have been different. It would have worked out differently if you had been here. And they're expressing faith in him. This is expressing faith, not doubt. They're saying this, this is not too difficult for you. You could have healed him. They've probably seen so many people get healed supernaturally there and 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 so but he goes you know this is this is not you know too difficult for you and then she adds there in verse 22 but even now i know that whatever you ask of god god will give you so she's still saying i believe this is an expression of faith and we don't know exactly what she's talking about but i believe that she doesn't close the door on on something like you know resurrection or whatever but she's saying that but she doesn't what she doesn't get though and what jesus is going to reveal because she's saying, you can ask God and God will give it to you. And she's like, he's, he's like, I am God. I am God in human flesh. I am the thing that you would say, I would pray and ask the Father of. I am um, all that, everything that, that you need me to be. And then Jesus added uh, in verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So yes, I'm Lord, I have my theology correct. I know that he's going to be resurrected. See, the Pharisees believed that in the resurrection. Of course, 
Jesus was teaching about the resurrection. It's the, it's the Sadducees that didn't believe in the resurrection. And they were the ruling class. They were the theologically liberal leaders. So they didn't believe in any of that. But she wasn't a part of that. She wasn't a part of that believing. She was, I know will rise again. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Beautiful. And this is the, the, the I am statement, the fifth I am statement that, uh, that I referred to earlier. And this is true for us. This is a fact. He says, he who believes in me, and this is, just not, this is not just mental agreement. This is talking about placing their trust in Jesus. Those of us that know the Lord, those of us that are born again, that though he may die, he shall live. And then he says in verse 26, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Why did he ask her that? Do you believe this? This is, this is what I've been saying all along. Do you believe this? And she answered in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So remember all this time we, we highlight that they had this expectation of a political Messiah? Even today they do. A political Messiah. It doesn't she linked though the fact of this resurrection and eternal life and all that with him? This is the Messiah's role. So obviously she's been a part of you know hearing all these things that Jesus has taught about and connecting the fact that he's the Messiah. And because of that, the main issue he'd be dealing with was he will save his people from their sins. So that's that, that's interesting that she does this because he she's expressing faith in his mission. Because she says, I believe that you are the Christ. That means the Messiah, the anointed one. She knew she was correct in terms of the mission of the Messiah, that he would save people from their sins. So she says, yes, and verse 28, and when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, why does it say secretly there in the middle of verse 28? And secretly called Mary, because he was wanted. He was a wanted man. And she didn't want to cause a big commotion and everything, and she wanted, but she wanted uh, Mary to talk to him. And so uh, that's what she did. As soon as she heard that, verse 29, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house, comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going, uh, she's going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary, uh, came, when, then Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Again, she's at his feet. Every time we see Mary, she's at his feet. Um, so she says the same thing. Again, I don't believe it's disrespectful. She's just disappointed. She's crushed because she believes the outcome wouldn't be the same if Jesus had, had been there. And remember, they're aware that Jesus you know, pronounced healing from long distance. He could have done that. He could have done that from 20 miles away. Lazarus, he's healed. Boom. And Lazarus is, is healed instantly. He's already demonstrated that he can do that. And, and, but they just believe that if he was there for sure, that, 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 he, that uh, their brother could have been healed. Verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. It's interesting. Why, is he, why do they have this in here? Why, why did John include this? And you think about Jesus, and of course we don't know. We don't know why all this happened. We can guess, and we'll, I'll give my suggestions. But uh, Jesus was affected by all this. He knew what he would do. He knew the outcome, but he was affected by everything that they were going through and all the pain and the suffering, and his heart was so connected to everything. Groaned means indignant in the original language, and troubled means unsettled and moved emotionally. So he was indignant regarding this, this scenario, this situation, and then he was moved emotionally and he was unsettled. And most people think that it, it's a good guess that it's the whole f fact of the fall, the consequences of sin, the consequences of, of all of this life that's apart from him and apart from the Father and all people that are without Jesus are sh like sheep without a shepherd, and just this whole thing of death that he would conquer soon as he's going to go to the cross and provide a way of salvation for mankind. But the fact that this is affecting people that he loved and he's seeing the toll that it's taking on them and, and all of that. 
And I think that's very, very reasonable to assume. I don't really into silence in scripture. I mean, I just give suggestions, but we don't know. If he wanted us to know exactly why, he would have, it would have, he would have revealed it. So we only see a very small sliver of the sins in the world, people's sins and what they do in wickedness. And we only see it for the little snapshot of our human lives. But God sees all of it. Every, all the wickedness that's happening right now, he sees all of it out at the same time. He knows the consequences of it. He knows how, what it's going to do in people and all of that. And you know, it, it grieves his heart. And so I love the fact that God reveals Jesus' heart here, that he was indignant, that he was unsettled, he was moved emotionally, he was in all, of, in all those things. And so we have to understand that God sees everything and it breaks his heart. I mean, why doesn't God stop Satan right now? It's, it's, part of, it's included in the whole reality that we need to choose. And, and we need, he honors that choice. And when he honors the fact that, I mean, first of all, we don't know what God's preventing right now. We never know what God saves us from at any given time. He has our guardian angels. We don't know how many times he saved our life this week. We have no idea. We need to thank him for all the things we don't see because he's always at work and he's always protecting us and all of that. So we don't know what God prevents. And sometimes when I'm trying to comfort people that have lost a loved one, I bring this up uh, at some point. Just like we don't know what God spared them from. We don't. He knows ahead what would happen if if they remained with us and saw that it was better to take them and we can trust him and all that. And of course, the emotions still run rampant and we know that's normal, that's fine. But the, the fact is we have to recognize that he's sparing us from things all the time and he's giving people time to repent. That's the second reason. There's a, there's a whole timing of everything. All of our lives are interwoven with other people's lives and he has a perfect plan for each of those people's lives and he's all working everything out, all of us together, connected, because we're, we're influencing each other. We're, we're, we're touching lives. And, and all of, there's a whole great plan that he's trying to accomplish. We don't see the whole thing. It's a tapestry that's being woven perfectly and flawlessly. And he's, seeing, he's looking from above and he's seeing this tapestry being woven. And we don't see it at the time. We don't see how it all connects. So he calls us just to trust him. And because he is worthy, that he can change things. And he cares. And he's sovereign. And he reveals that prayer is powerful. So we have to trust him with what we don't understand. He can handle our questions, by the way. Don't be afraid to ask him questions. He may reveal those things to you, or he may not. Again, he doesn't owe us anything, but he is an appropriate savior, and he always blesses us. We can ask him so many questions. I love when people say, oh, when I get there, I'm going to ask him a few questions, you know, like like they're going to call him on the carpet. And really what they're going to do is they're just going to bow before him and recognize that he's, he, there's no one greater than him. And, you know, I don't know what he's going to show us related to our lives and why things happen. He may do that. I mean, it's not like we don't have time, you know, in the future. He has all the time in the world. And he's, you know, he's so faithful to be able to bless us with all those things that we need. So verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see now, obviously, it's not that he didn't know. He's wanting to draw out of them those things and also bring as many people along with as possible for them to witness this. And so they say, Lord, come and see. And then we're told in verse 35, Jesus wept. So it's, it's getting to him. It appears it's getting to him, just this whole situation of, of, of death and this whole situation of pain and suffering that the people that he loves are experiencing and all of that. It's, it's, it's the shortest verse in the, in the New Testament, in English anyway. Um, there's other shorter ones in Greek, but we don't read Greek. So, But he, he knows what they're going through. He knows what they're experiencing and everything, and he, and he has a heart. I love that. I love that he has a heart, and he is a compassionate high priest. And In all things, he was tempted just like we are, yet without sin. We have a compassionate high priest that can relate to us, that can say, I've gone through that. Remember, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, Isaiah tells us. He, he was acquainted with grief. His, his own people rejected him. If you've been rejected and, and experienced that hurt, Jesus knows what it's like to be rejected by his own people. He wept at, on Palm Sunday. When he gets there and gets to the bottom and he just cries and weeps, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you as a hand gathers her chicks, but you would not. You would not come to me. So he's not going to force himself on anybody. And so he has this heart. I, I just love the fact that he reveals it so boldly. 
And so he encourages us. There's a scripture I want to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he knows how much joy that would bring. We've been waiting for to be reunited with, with loved ones that have gone before us. He doesn't even let us wait for however long it takes to get from the clouds into to heaven, you know, with our new bodies and everything. To, to, he brings our loved ones with him. I love that. He's thought of everything. Can you imagine the moment that they get told, the rapture's happening right now, get ready, and they're like, ah, and then they're there with us, and we're there with, with them. And the dead in Christ risen, rose first before us, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and we're transformed, metamorphosized. Our bodies are transformed with our new bodies, and we're there with our loved ones. Think of right now who are your loved ones that have gone before you. They'll be waiting for you. They'll be the first people that you see, and the people that, that you can't wait to see. And spend. Now there's no more separation. Now you're going to be able to spend eternity together. I just love it. I just love how God thinks of, of everything, and he just demonstrates his heart. So they, then they say in verse 36, then the Jews uh, said, see how he loved him. So they're saying, look, he's weeping. It was visual. He must be weeping because of how much he loved him. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also keep this man from dying? Yes, absolutely he could have done that. But it was better that he did something different. It was, it was to be preferred because he was going to use that in their lives forever, in the disciples' lives, in the sisters' lives, in everyone watching in their lives. It was going to be, it's going to affect the religious leaders. They're going to talk about this later. We'll see it. And, and it's going to, there's so much purpose in it. So yes, he could have, but that wasn't what's best. You know, God always does what's best. Verse 38, Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead more than uh, has been dead four days. I love the new King James. Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> That's what it says. Uh, he stinketh. And he's trying to warn him of the smell. And again, I think, you know, obviously he has to be, that stone has to be moved from to come out. So he's doing that. But also, Jesus knows that, that they're never going to forget this. All the people that witnessed this. They could be able to say, even decades later, I was there. I smelled the stench. It was real. It was, he was dead for sure. And, 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 I, and you know how, scent, how smell is connected to memory so often? You know, you're going through Walmart or something, and all of a sudden you smell this smell, and you're like, oh, what is that? And then it brings back a memory. Oh, it's a Cadbury egg. I used to have those in my Easter baskets when I was seven. That's what it was. Something just random. You ever just thought of crazy stuff from your past and that you forgot about, but it's connected to some smell. I've had smells where, where I smell something and I go, I don't know, I don't recognize that, but I know that's in my past somewhere. And you try to remember, you know. And so they're going to be connected to all this. They're going to be remembering all of that. And, uh, you know, he, she, Jesus said to her in verse 40, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And that's... So true. He calls us to believe when we don't understand. We don't understand how he's working. And so often we see the glory of God. Yes, it would have been glorious for Jesus to heal Lazarus before he died. But to see him after he died and do that and all of that, that's the glory of God. So often the things that we're upset about, we're saying, Jesus, why are you working this way? Why are you allowing this? It's for the purpose of glory through our lives. Somehow God is choosing that instead of what we expect because he's going to get glory through us. And that's what we want. We pray, Lord, be glorified through my life. Then he doesn't work the way that we expect. And well, I didn't mean that. There, you, know, you can do it many other ways, but not that way. But he knows what's best. And so often the grace that he pours out on our lives to walk in a certain situation or through a certain situation People look at it and go, how are you doing it? How are you holding up? And, and they realize, especially after you share, that it's the grace of God. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. There's, I mean, have you ever said, had people be interviewed on TV that had someone do something horrible to a loved one, and you have a believer on there just going, I forgive him. Jesus forgave me, and I forgive him. It's not easy, 
but you know, and everyone's in shock that they could actually say something like that. But but when God works in our lives supernaturally, He gives us grace for all these things. Jesus didn't lie to us. He said, "In this life, you will face tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world." He was honest with us. He shot straight with us. We shouldn't be stumbled by when he works differently than what we expect. Again, doesn't owe us anything. He does love us, of course, but he's always going to do what's best. So I love that truth about him and that we can take, that, we can take this passage and, and, and remember back in the future of how all these things were going to get, uh, be glorifying to, to the Lord. Verse 41, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Again, all this is aiming for to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that God promised. And, and so that they would not doubt. Verse 43. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Someone has said he needed to say Lazarus or else he would have cleared out that whole area. Of, you know, it's, uh, I, I understand that. You, know, you, have to, you have to be able to be specific because you know, when you say come forth and there's no cemetery, that could be really bad. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to be re- really careful. Um, he's going to do that at the rapture. He's going to say, he won't say everyone's name, but he's going to say to them, come forth. And, and the tombs are going to be emptied and the dead in Christ will rise first. Church, that's really going to happen. It's really going to happen. The people that have gone before you, it's really going to happen. You are going to see them again. You are going to be able to talk to them and hug them and, and just rejoice with them and, and walk the streets of gold and explore the new Jerusalem with them. And that's all coming. It's all in our future because of what he did for us on the cross. Verse 44 And he who died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth, just as Jesus was. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. It's always going to result, people placing their faith in him. What was that reunion like? What was that? What did they they say to him? What did he say back to them? Did he go, come out of the grave and go, Oh, no, not this place again. I was in such a better place. Why'd you do this? I don't know. We can ask Lazarus someday what he said. What was the walk home like? Was, you know, was Lazarus upset? Did he have to get over it? I don't know. I'm sure he was rejoicing over the fact that God used him to have many people come to know him and all of that. So as I close, God doesn't always work in ways that we would expect. And so we can trust him, though, because of how he died for us on the cross. He always has our best interest in mind. He always works all things together for good to those that love him and are the called according to his purposes. That we may be further conformed in the image of his son. So he takes the things that happen, the good that he talks about in Romans 8, 28, all, works, all things together for good. I heard a zipper. We're not done yet. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't expect that to happen. Oh, I love my friends. Anyway, um, so... The point is, is that God, God works in ways that we don't expect, and we can trust him with all the things that, are, that happen that are different than what we expect. And what we need to expect is that he'll do the right thing and trust him. And that he's going to work it in our lives for a specific purpose to bring us closer to Christ. And I think he's worthy of that trust. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for doing this miracle. Thank you for John recording it. And we just want to honor you with our faith, Lord. Our lives are yours. You don't have to work how, how we think you should work. You can work however you choose because you're a loving father. You have grace for all of it. And we just thank you, Lord, that, that you're such a good God. You've demonstrated to us over and over your faithfulness. So thank you for all the grace we get to receive to deal with every situation that we find ourselves in. We know you're good and we, we love you for it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.